Greetings, my name is Russ Fraze and thank you for joining us and studying. This is the third part of a lesson on doctrine and the Bible is the basis of doctrine and we've talked about the importance of doctrine, that doctrine is critical to who we think we are in the scriptures, how we act and how we live and shape our lives. It has to come from the word of God. And so tonight we're going to talk about um, how to approach the Bible. We've talked about the Bible as the biblical foundation for doctrine and for our lives. And, and so how, how do you approach the Bible? Many people do not read the Bible. In fact, 51% of American Christians are basically illiterate biblically because they don't read the Bible. And I think the reason that people don't read the Bible is they don't know how to read the Bible. Nobody has taught them. And once you learn how to read and study the Bible, then everything changes. It's like going from uh, night to day, day to night. And uh, so tonight we're going to talk about how, how to approach the Bible. And the first thing we understand is, is that we, we know it is inspired. I know this word is inspired because of the nature of it, because of what I learn, because of what it does to me as I study the scripture. And so Paul tells us that it's God breathed, it's inspired, and we believe that. And you must believe that this is the inspired word of God, that every portion of the scripture is inspired by God and written. And so the, the story and the theme itself, going from Genesis to Revelation, taking the life of Christ and the nation of Israel and the law, coming into grace and the whole story of the Bible is one incredible unity. The theme all connects together. There's no novel. There's no historical book. There's no theological book. Well, maybe not theological book, but the books of antiquity of Plato and Aristotle's, none of them have the theme and the unity that the scriptures have. And so you have to know it's timeless. I was thinking just recently, in fact, a few hours before I came to tape this program, that the Bible is timeless. And I begin to think that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, his word is as, as timeless as he is. God is everlasting. God is eternal. So are Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and so are we who know him. And so since Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, then the word of God also is the same today, tomorrow, the next day, the next year, and people who pick it up 20, 30 years from now, if there is such a time then, they will be saying the same thing. And so the, you, you have to know that it's timeless. The, the scriptures are timeless. The story is timeless. Everything that's in the Bible is timeless. So we know that it's inspired. We know that it's timeless. And when you believe that, that changes everything. Then thirdly, we have to know that the scripture is personal. David said, open my eyes to thy word to see the wondrous things of the word. And so this is a, this is a personal book. It, it guides us into everything. In fact, John 15, 12 says us that it, it shows us things to come. It guides us into all truth. Also, he talks about that the Holy Spirit brings to our remembrance that which we've heard and that which we've learned. And so it's a personal book. For instance, in Psalm 23, the personal pronouns of I and me and mine, uh, 20 sometimes we see that. So this is a personal book. This is your book. This is my book, and it's a book for the ages. And so believing that it's personal, that it speaks to us personally. I cannot tell you how many times in the last 50 years when I've needed to hear from God or I've needed to hear something from the Word, that the personal truth of the Word is what continues to drive me on to serve the Lord, is what continues to thrill my soul. Uh, the Word is a feast and taste the Lord and see that He is good. So it's a, it's a personal book. It's not an impersonal book. 
The gods of humanity have impersonal books. The philosophy of humanities are impersonal so many times about theory and fact. But this word is personal. This word is true. And it's applicable to every aspect of our life. Spirit, soul, and body. This word uh, applies to our our makeup that spirit soul and body and so it's a it's a good word we must know that it uh, leads to success and prosperity we see in psalms 1 uh, the the uh, the successful and prosperous aspect of the scripture where he tells us that um, that we meditate in the law of the lord day and night uh, that's uh, 24 hours, when we're sleeping, we can be meditating in the law of the Lord if we ask the Lord to bring it to our mind while we're sleeping, and he'll do that in dreams and visions and visitations. But he said that uh, they that delight in the law of the Lord meditate in it day and night. They're like trees planted by rivers of water and uh, bearing fruit each season. We have different seasons, and we can bear fruit in every season of our life, and that everything we put our hands to will prosper. And then Joshua says the same thing in Joshua 1. This is what allowed Joshua to move the nation of Israel or to become the nation of Israel when he says that, um, uh, be strong and very courageous, be careful to obey all the instructions of Moses and uh, do not deviate from them, turning neither from the right to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do and study this book of instruction continually, meditating on it day and night, so you will be sure to obey everything written. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. And so therefore, prosperity and being successful not only deals with the graciousness of God, but it deals with us. We have to study the word and we have to obey the word and then we ourselves will make our way successful. And so we know that. Now also, in how do we approach the Bible? We, we must know that we must know the Holy Spirit author because it's the Holy Spirit that wrote this book with man and so uh, we must know the Holy Spirit. I, I've got a book I've written on called The Holy Spirit, The Person, Work, and Ministry of the Holy Spirit. And this goes from Genesis to Revelation and gives you a basic foundation of the Holy Spirit, who He is, what He does, what He wants to be in you, and what He is in the world. And uh, it's uh, being translated into 12 languages, and we're printing them in those languages. And uh, uh, so we encourage you to go online, joshuanations.org, or go to amazon.com, and you can order a copy of, of that. So how do we study the Bible? We've talked about how to approach the Bible, but how does one study the Bible? Well, the first thing is we must always pray for the Holy Spirit to open up the truths of the Scriptures. And John 14 teaches how he will do that for us and what the Holy Spirit will do in interpreting the scriptures. So we must always pray. So when I come to study the Bible, I just simply fold my hands and ask the Lord, you know, Father, show me what's in the word. Holy Spirit, open the word that you wrote. Give me something new, understanding, meaningful that I can use for me and use for others. And so invoke the presence of the Holy Spirit as you study then be diligent to study the Word of God. Uh, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. So we're diligent in studying the Scriptures over and over and over and over. Meditate in the law day and night. Study the Scriptures. Read them. Memorize the Scriptures. If anybody ought to know the Bible and the book, it ought to be Christian leaders, pastors, you and me. We ought to know this book. And so that's why it drives me all the time to study the Word because I need to know it better. Even after 50 years of study, I still need to know the Word of God far greater and better than I do. So that never ends. That never ends until you go to the grave. And so be diligent. Then 
read thoroughly and meditatively, like the scriptures in Joshua 1, 7, and 8. Read them thoroughly and meditate on those. It, it says, think about them. Do not let them go out of your mouth. So you're speaking the word, and it says, think about them. And then it says, put them into operation. And so as we, as we read the word through and think it through and pray it through and think it out and then write it out, you'll be amazed at what the scriptures will yield to you. And so we should then study the Bible with many questions. I don't know about you, but I have many questions about the scriptures. And so some questions you can ask. Who is writing this? Who's the author? What's he like? Where did he come from? Why does he have the right to write this? And learn about who it is that writes the scripture. Who is it written to? What is it saying? Where is it written? Uh, this whole book was written, of course, uh, in, in, in the Middle East and, and from uh, Jewish authors. And uh, uh, where was it written? And, and when was it written? And if it was written uh, thousands of years ago, then how on earth can it be right for today, right for me? And how can the message be? And that's the genius of inspiration and God seeing the scriptures being written. Why was it written? And what does it say to you personally? And what does it say to me? Then how do you apply it to yourself? And so there's three purposeful ways to study the scriptures. There's many, but there's three, I think, that, that I use. If you're somewhere where you have no resources, you have no uh, dictionaries, you have no Logos, you know, have no Bible software, you have no resources like so many people in the world, then how do you study the Bible? So there's three ways. One of those is observation. As you read the text, what do you see in the text? What do you notice and what do you perceive that is there? And so you, you pay special attention to every word and every detail. Think of it this way. You're an investigator in a crime scene. Now, my wife and I, every now and then, will watch one of these... Uh, uh, NCI movies or one of these movies where they're investigating a crime. And so the investigator, they move every stone. They look for every fact. They turn everything upside down. And so you investigate the scriptures so you can see it and you feel it and you know it. And the Holy Spirit begins to work that scripture into your consciousness and into your mind and you gather all the facts and you use all of your reasoning powers and your Holy Spirit powers to bring to you the truth that's in the scripture. And so as I've said you read it through, you think it through, you think it out, you write it out and it will come into being the understanding. And so you look for things that are emphasized Maybe words that are repeated, words that are opposites, or words that are similar, or words that are familiar, and uh, words that are not alike. And so you just, you just take the whole text and you begin to deal with it. So you, be, you observe everything that's there, you're like an investigator, or you're like an automotive mechanic. That I marvel at automotive mechanics, how they can take an old motor and take it all apart, then put it back together again. So what you're doing is you're taking the word, you're taking it all apart, you're laying the facts out, you know, you've got it on paper, you've got it in your mind, and you're studying, and you've got information here and information here. You take it all apart, and then with the Holy Spirit help, you put it back together, and then you get the truth. So that's observation. You observe what is there. Then the second purposeful way to study is interpretation. And this is where you rely upon the writer who the Holy Spirit is. There's no private interpretation to man, but that which comes by the Holy Spirit. 
And so you pray for the truth to come, as we've said. You, you, you approach the text in, in different ways. And uh, you, you read the text and you lift the truth out of the text that's called exegesis. You exegete, you lift out the truth that is there. Now, you have to be careful because you don't want to put truths into the text that are not there. That's called eisegesis. That means to bring in. So you exegete, you lift out what is there. You don't want to put ideas into the text that are not there. Then uh, another way in interpretation is the law of context, which is most helpful. So when you have a text, you read what comes before the text, and you read what follows the text, and many times that governs the truth of the text. So the law of context, what is really there, and this brings the overall idea to you. Now, Scripture interprets Scripture, and so as you read the Scripture over and over, the Old Testament and the New Testament, we know that the New Testament truths are concealed in the Old, and the Old Testament truths are revealed in the New. And so scripture interprets scripture. And many times if you don't understand things, another scripture will interpret that scripture and you say, oh, now I see it. Now I understand. Now this is interpreting something I read way back here in the Old Testament. And then you'll see the same thing in the Old Testament. You can see New Testament truths. Now know this, that scripture does not contradict itself. If you find a scripture that seems to contradict itself, then you haven't prayed enough or you haven't read enough or studied well enough. And usually many times it's it's just a misunderstanding. It may be language. It may be a translation. And so I work with four or five different translations. Whenever I'm interpreting a text, I'll have four or five different translations and read what they all say, and they all come to the same way. They just say it differently. So interpret Scripture literally where you can. Take it at face value. If it says something, that's usually what it means instead of adding something to it. And so uh, a literal translation is the best. So there's observation and there's interpretation. Then finally there's application. So you say, what does this mean to me? How do I make it a part of my life? How do I practice and live out what I've studied, what I've read, and these truths? And so somebody said that we get into the Word and the Word gets in us and we get it into others. I think that's very profound. We get into the Word, and the Word gets into us, then we get it into others. Or somebody put it this way, we don't just read the Bible, but the Bible reads us. And I think that's one of the most profound statements in regards to the Scripture, because the Bible will read you, it'll read your mail. Amen. It, it'll, it'll read you so well that you know you've been read, if that makes sense. And so that's important in application. So here's some questions as we conclude uh, about application. And 12 questions you can, ask, you can ask of the text. For instance, 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. Take those verses or any of these verses or your favorite verses, and say, is there an attitude to adjust? Is there a promise to gain? Is there a priority in my life that I need to change? What's the lesson I need to learn? And is there an issue to resolve? Have I got an issue that I need to resolve? Is there a command to obey? Is there an activity to avoid? Is there a truth to believe? Is there an idol to pull down? Is there an offense to forgive? Is there a new direction to take? And is there a sin to confess? If you will take you a pad and ask these questions, then you will be able to apply the word to your life. So there's observation, there's interpretation, and there's application. God bless you until we study together again.